Um, I am in a vision time, a vision season, a season um, where our church, all the ministries we lead, we're paying attention to our vision, <laughs> our mandate, what God called us to do, and uh, how well he's called us to do it, and how what we're supposed to do um, with it, and it's very important, you know, as we have started to uh, progress and we have started to move forward, it is so important that you pay attention to vision, and so I'm excited about all that God is entrusting to us, you saw me with the hammer, absolutely, um, but I'm so excited about this season, and I was thinking about um, how many ministries are so off-centered with regard to vision, and many times that could be the reason for the absence of productivity. And you know, I know you don't believe this, but it's actually very true that when a ministry, a church or whatever has vacated vision, the distinction that you need to know. And there is a difference between meeting people's um, uh, survival needs and having them progress in life. So that's very, very, very important. Again, what I'm saying to you is that when a house, a ministry, an organization, any of that stuff departs from vision, what they start do is they start just existing. And you know, I talk to pastors all the time and pastors who should be pastoring and pastors who should not be pastoring. But I talk to people who start things all the time. And one of the things that I know about people who shouldn't start things is that they don't really have real vision. I mean, they have goals, they have objectives, uh, they have things they'd like to achieve, but none of those fit the parameter of vision. You can always know who should be leading what they're leading by their ability to explain why they are leading it. If you are a part of an organization and that organization has no clear mission, Mission, then that organization really does not exist. Uh, it only exists in theory and it only exists in concept. Unfortunately, that is the truth about a lot of organizations. You know, if you ask them what you, you know, wh wh why are we come here for? Some people say we come to church to praise God. Some people say we come to church to hear the word. Some people say we come to church to, to be a help. And all of those things are um, not exclusively the reason and the fundamental values behind why Jesus established the church and put it on, on, the, on planet earth. And so I'm always concerned when I don't hear the pressure of vision in the articulation of its head. You've got to know vision. You've got to cast vision. It's the basis of your leadership development. It's the basis of your project. In our church, vision determines who we hire. It determines who we fire. It determines our programs. It determines our ideas. We are a vision and we're first and foremost a Christ-centered ministry. But secondarily, we are very, very, very strict to our vision and what we're doing. And it grieves me that there's a lot of visionary people that have submitted their lives to houses that don't really have vision. And unfortunately, without vision, there is no future because vision basically articulates what the future is to be. And if you are in a house that refuses to articulate the future, they're basically telling you we have nowhere to take you. Uh, so vision is what is going on in tomorrow that we have perceived and that we have chronicled and that we have recorded and we have begun to prepare for. So without vision, it's difficult to be diligent. Without vision, it's difficult to be concentrated. Without vision, it's difficult to be disciplined in your investments and what you do and what you invest in. And so oftentimes, I, 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 what I do know is that when there's uh, some certain examples, I'm just giving you backdrop so before I tell you my vision, but there are certain examples where uh, a leader had vision for a place and then uh, he didn't notice in his faithfulness that he didn't, he wasn't the one to give vision no more. So let's say, you know, we've been pastoring for 30 years and then after year 30, You've, you've gone into routine and you don't realize that you don't have any new insight about what's next. It is at that juncture, irrespective of how old you are, how seasoned, how veteran, veteran you are, you should probably invest in somebody else that has vision. Because again, it's at the, at the juncture where you no longer have vision for where you're taking people that you are disqualified from taking them anyway. Now look at this witchcraft. Somebody trying to make me chant. No, no, devil. All right, so that is very, very important. Thank you for all of you that are sharing and 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 bringing your people in. That's blessing me. So vision is so important. 
Um, it's what we pray. It's, it's why we gather. It is the energy that we center around and we are upheld by the word of God. Thank you so much, but it is so important. And today I was reflecting on the vision that the Lord gave me for All Nations Worship Assembly. And uh, the way vision operates is that it is revealed to the senior leader in its most potent form. So when somebody is a senior leader or the carrier of a vision or the house of vision, what happens is they get their vision revealed to them by God in its most potent potent form. My example of that would be uh, Moses. Moses had to ascend, go to the top of a mountain for a conversation God would not have with him on his level. Once he changed planes and ascended and went up to be where God was, God began to give him vision. We know it as a Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and that vision that God gave to Moses became the very rock bed of, of what the rest of society would, ever, would forever be built upon. And what that looks like is all of the laws around the world are basically built upon why ain't periscope let me block nobody man bam gotcha uh yeah so that's important and so moses is challenged in was coming back off the mountain and finding a way to articulate and interpret and translate uh, what God showed him on the top of the mountain. So that's very important. Vision is revealed to the leader in its most potent form. You know the mistake that we make though? Uh, we make the mistake of taking that vision in the form it was revealed to us and giving it to our leaders and our congregation in the exact same way. It is the equivalent of feeding your infant steak and it is the equivalent of, you know, taking... I don't know, very tough substance and not doing your due diligence to decode that for people who don't live where everybody else lives. So that's very, very, very important. Um, and so uh, the first year of our church, I did that. I gave them the vision as it was given to me, but I started noticing that they didn't bite it as quick as I bite, bit it. And, and the reason they didn't, it was because I didn't put it into the terms and the words and the levels that they could understand it and make it foremost applicable to their lives. So on the way back down, from the mountain, you've got to figure out a way to translate this to your people to make them run and to make them follow. And so um, what we did was we took our, our whole vision and we put our whole vision in the acronym CHALLENGE. So All Nations Worship Assembly, its subsidiaries and its campuses all have this vision, CHALLENGE, C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G-E, -L -L -E -E, okay? The C is for cultural and social transformation. The A is for apostolic teams and church planting. The L is for leadership development and discovery. The other L is for linking families together. That E is for educating and equipping the saints. That N is for new perspectives of church. That G is for generational unity and impact. And that final E is for excelling and healthy living. That is all the vision, what we intend to achieve, what we're called by God to do, what we've been anointed to do. I'm sorry, the H in the challenge is harvesting city and nations. Harvesting cities and nations. Sorry, please forgive me. So yeah, that is our challenge. Now, that's the vision, is the word challenge. And it's really the anointing that's on our house. No matter where you're from, where you come from, the back, your denominational background, your educational background, all of that, you will be challenged to some degree or another once you come into an all nations environment. It is the power, it is the grace, it is the strength that God has put upon what we do is to challenge. And not just to challenge uh, in the sense of you're doing something wrong, but to challenge you and to confront where you are so as to help you and escort you to where you need to go for God's plan for your life. That is our what. That is what we do. But it's not our how. Different from our what. So the vision, that is what we're supposed to do. But the how is going to be the philosophy. Many people confuse the two. Many church leaders, many church pastors confuse the two. We know the what. We want to do this, we want to do that, we want to do that. But we don't necessarily know the how. How are you going to achieve it? And so I have worked on and developed a philosophy of ministry that basically upholds and is the foundation between all that we do as a church, okay? And basically what that looks like is a general philosophy of ministry that, up, that upholds and that supports our vision. This philosophy of ministry is the way of life for all nations worship assembly. There is a way of life that we must adapt 
adapt in order to make sure that vision goes uncompromised. Again, when people cast vision, when leaders cast vision, when preachers cast vision, organizational heads cast vision, but they don't describe the way you need to live, think, and behave so as to make sure that vision is consistent, what they end up doing is having hopes, desires, ideas, but vision can't be approached until people are built in the way uh, that makes them able to handle the rigors and the testings of vision. And so this is our philosophy of ministry. I've given you our vision, but now I'm going to give you our philosophy of ministry, which is how we do what we do, the all nations way of life. The first fundamental, it keeps a little bit, but the first fundamental uh, uh, aspect of our philosophy of ministry is deliverance, is deliverance. These are going to be five Ds. That's the all nations way of life, what establishes our culture. And the first D is deliverance. When we began our ministry, it was the name, the deliverance was in the name. Deliverance is the, the foundational uh, concept that justified our gathering. It was the call to set free and to be set free. And the reason is because it's a priority to Jesus. Your great commission, the great commission that we all tote and float around and act as if, you know, it can only be achieved by witnessing to the laws, uh, begins with deliverance. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16 through 18, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned in my and these signs will follow them that believe in my name they will cast out devils cast out devils i don't know why it's freezing let's see if we can do some help now but it says in my name they will cast out devils that is the first directive and the first sign of somebody that would believe according to Jesus Christ. Now, according to American Christianity, that's not the first sign. According to your denomination's Christianity, that's not the first sign. According to Christian TV, that ain't the first sign. But according to your Bible, Jesus said the first sign, he mentioned deliverance even before speaking with tongues. And there are some denom... All right. So... Here's where we were, thank you. Deliverance, let me find somewhere I can chill. Deliverance, so the first one is deliverance. Deliverance is the fundamental philosophy of ministry for all we do in all nations. It is a way, probably a lot of other things, but the way we approach our vision, the first thing we're going to do, first thing we talk about, first thing we emphasize in all that we do is going to be deliverance in some form. Now, and the reason we that is a priority for us beyond it just being uh, the way we founded our ministry is because Jesus said in Mark 16, 16 through 18 in the in the great commission all christians around the world quote jesus said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved whoever does not believe will be damned and then it says and these signs will follow them that believe it says in my name they will cast out devils they will cast out devils so Jesus actually lists the casting out of devils before he lists speaking with new tongues. Now you people love to quote what Peter and, 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 and what Paul said all the way in the book of Acts, but then you conveniently ignore what Jesus said in the Great Commission. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was that you need to cast out devils. And so the casting out of devils, beyond just being an act, it is also a culture and it is also a way of life. Jesus cast out devils. It was, the Bible says when he preached the kingdom, and then in Matthew chapter 12 it says, if I preach the kingdom of God and or deliverance is the sign of the kingdom of God if I by the finger of God cast out devils and the kingdom of God has come unto you is what Jesus said so Jesus said that a sign that you have actually come into the kingdom is that they're going to be the casting out of devils and I don't believe that just means out of people I believe that's the beginning part but I believe there's a casting out of devils out of people I believe cities can have devils cast out of them I believe families can undergo deliverance I believe uh, uh, cultures can 
undergo deliverance, I actually believe God can actually deliver entire nations. So when we limit deliverance and the deliverance concept and the deliverance culture to paper towels and vomiting, yeah, well, that's just the basic. That That's just the beginning part. And most of you don't even, you know, do that. But I believe whole cities can be delivered and can experience the power of deliverance. And so at all nations, this is the, the how behind the what. The challenge is the what, but the how is going to be deliverance. It's a part of all that we do is deliverance, a deliverance culture that guards everything that we do. The second thing is after deliverance, this is our philosophy of ministry and the way we approach ministry and vision after de deliverance is going to be emphasis on devotion. No Christian can excel without a broad revelation of worship. You know, there's a lot of people that are singing and there's a lot of people that are dancing around the world and a lot of people with garments and nunchucks in their hands and pretty pillows and, and they say, and there's even more artists, you know, this is the day where everybody has an EP and everybody has a record, but I'm finding that a lot of the people that are singing and a lot of the people that are recording and writing have no understanding of worship. They have no understanding of worship in the Bible. They have no understanding of what it achieves. If you were to ask them to preach a whole message on fidelity, single-heartedness, singleness of eye, singleness of, of, of decision, the whole conversation about worship in the Old and New Testament, they don't understand. Now, in our philosophy of ministry, immediately after deliverance, we've got to teach devotion because if you get free and if God saves you and if he emancipates you from curses and bondage and, and darkness and wickedness and evil, then you're probably go, going to go back to the darkness that you're comfortable with if we don't get you acquainted with the light. And the way we get you acquainted with the light is by devotion, is by devotion. That is very important that you get it. Now, doctrine is a part of devotion. Doctrine is a part of devotion because a part of worship is conformity, which includes learning who God is learning who God is and if you learn who God is you learn what God wants you learn what he does you learn what he wants to do in you this is the our culture this is what we do even accidentally it is who God has made us as a people so from deliverance and then we give you devotion we're going to emphasize worship we're going to spend quality time with God in worship we're going to learn the power of music and the power of daily discipline the power of seeking the Lord it's a part of our culture Culture. We are a worshiping people. And then immediately from devotion, we're going to teach you discipleship. You will, you will fail as a Christian without the right community. And there's a lot of uh, inner city churches that don't emphasize the power of community. But what happens is if we've got you through deliverance and we take you to devotion, then what's going to happen is if you are not garrisoned and if you are not guarded and if you are not protected with a, a, a hedge, a hedge, you're not going to understand the power of the kingdom you've actually been a part of. The first thing Jesus did when he came to the world was he established a community, a discipleship community of protégés and of people he could invest his life with. And I believe it was his first priority. He spent more time doing that than he did anything else. And you, you know, we've got a generation of leaders and we've got a season of leaders that don't invest in discipleship. They actually see it as a waste of time. They see it as something that should be delegated to the deacons. They see it as something that should not be invested in. But again, a kingdom is supposed to spend time investing in those that live within it. You cannot give. Let me block this demon. You cannot give yourself to devoting yourself to the didactics of any culture if there's no environment where people can pour into you. This is exactly why discipleship is a part of the talk. It's a part of the language. It's a part of the revelation. It's a part of the share that we have. And it's uncommon, and I'm gonna be very transparent with you. It actually is one of the parts of our philosophy of ministry that takes us the long route. Because when you take time for people, people are fickle, they are unreliable, and they are always uh, they're not really as stable so taking the time to stable stabilize people and bring them into the covenant of the kingdom or the or the culture of the kingdom and bring them into New Testament reality it takes time so with with a, a ministry like that where discipleship is a part of your priority then what happens is you end up putting people before programs you put people before projects you put people before uh, paperwork and and that's really backwards and opposite from a lot of 
lot of what we see in ministry. We don't understand how important people are to God. So because people have become pawns in our little schemes to get famous and to be on magazine book covers and to become these glorified, you know, preacher celebrity people, we don't understand what it is to discern and to make time for and to invest in people as unto the Lord. But at all nations, discipleship is important. I believe that without discipleship, your deliverance is up for grabs. Many people won't teach you that. What will happen is they'll bring you to an altar. They'll cast the devil out of you. They'll let, hopefully, man, most of them don't do that. They'll lay hands on you, talk to you about your sin, and then they'll send you back to the world, the matter of life, the environment and the culture that was responsible for pouring into you and for introducing you to the wickedness that they just got you free from. In the, in the medical community, they would call that malpractice. They'll cut on you and won't sew you up. They will cut and perform per, uh, a surgery, a surgical procedure on you and remove things from your life and send you out for outpatient surgery, sitting there left to do it by yourself. But when you have been set free from something that's going to be consistently pursuant of you, pursuant of your purpose, pursuant of where you're going, the way you do it is you establish a hedge. One of my favorite verses on that concept is found in the book of Ecclesiastes where it says, whoso breaketh the hedge, the servant will bite. Whoso breaketh the hedge, the serpent will bite. When you rip a, a discipleship hedge, the only thing that has access to you are serpents and snakes and scorpions. The relationship hedge, the community that is formed around you is one of God's sciences for keeping snakes from devouring you and poisoning you and wrapping itself around you. Even the ones that you like. See, that's the power of a real hedge. The power of a real hedge will be that they are objective, that they don't have a natural affinity to agreeing with you just because you want them to. But a real hedge can identify. Let me pull up out of this because I, I love discipleship. But discipleship is important. So again, we got deliverance, we got devotion, and now we got discipleship. Now, when you got deliverance and then you got devotion and then you got discipleship, then there is something else that we've got to do and that's we've got to build demonstrators. Demonstration is very important. In the all nations culture, the what is the challenge, but the how is this, demonstration. We have been called by God to be demonstrators of everything we know. I think one of the reasons why we have inherited the, the type of country and culture we have now is because we taught people the importance of doctrine, but we didn't teach them the importance of demonstration. But I wanna let you know that demonstration is the fruit of doctrine. If you cannot demonstrate what you've learned, then you ought to question if you've learned it to begin with. And there's a lot of people that base their ministries and base their churches on what they're taught, what they're taught. But the Bible says that we need to be doers, doers. And there are some teaching houses that are phenomenal with their teaching. They have tremendous concept. They're didactics all, all, all over the place. But there is no opportunity to demonstrate the doctrine. Doctrine must be demonstrated. A, a people and a place that has stopped at doctrine can never fulfill all the fullness of Christ that they want to do because we have been called to be doers. And the problem is, is we have built a generation of thinkers, of wishers, of hopers, of feelers, of praisers, of, 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 of survivors. You know, everybody one of them, praise me if you, but we don't have a bunch of doers. There's not a bunch of people who understand the concept of doing what your doctrine says, of doing. So, and the way that works is that's not just supernatural but it's also in life I do what I need to do to become a good father and I do what I need to do to become a good husband and I do what I need to do to maintain myself but because our Bible is a book of what is done the the, the pattern that we have in the book of Acts is a record and a chronological a, a book a recording of people who did stuff not just preach stuff not just sang about stuff but people who did it and so a part of what our value value system is, is that we all have got to do what we're learning. It, 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 the, the thing is, is if you're learning it and you're believing for what you're learning to change your life, is that a possibility if there is no doing? And the answer is emphatically no. Jesus said a powerful scripture in the book of Matthew that and he said, blessed is he who does what he teaches. And he, and he calls the Pharisees wicked for teaching and not doing. So you've got to do it. You've got to do it. You don't just come to church to celebrate the fact
fact that you serve a savior that used to heal and a savior that delivered in, in the in the in the in the in the in the synoptic gospels and celebrate the death on Calvary. Listen, if those of you that, that are in the household of faith and you've not moved from Calvary to the kingdom, then you are still living in a very condemned, very old testament, very antiquated model of ministry for Jesus. Calvary is the beginning. I want you to hear that. Your beginning is not these bloods of bulls and goats. For those of us that became uh, after the order of Jesus Christ, who the Bible says was the first fruit of a new species of human being, Calvary was not your end. Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say he was finished. He had just got started at Calvary. As a matter of fact, his greatest exploits could not be done until he departed the earth. But the way y'all teach it and the way y'all preach it and the way they got you learning in Sunday school is that Calvary was the end. Calvary, you know, we sell it, that's it. But I'm telling you, there is something beyond Calvary and it's the kingdom of God. He gave you access to be and do all that he is. Now we celebrate the cross, we celebrate Calvary, but it's not our end. It is the beginning place to those of us that belong to the seed of God and to the righteousness of the kingdom, okay? So that's important. You've got to become a doer. And, and then after, so after demonstration, the whole point of all that we do or the whole uh, uh, anchoring of all our discussion is going to be destiny. It's going to be destiny. This is the five-fold philosophy of ministry of all nations. Number one is deliverance. Number two is devotion. Number three is discipleship. Number four is demonstration. Number five is destiny. There is no point and there is no purpose at you belonging to anything if it does not contribute to who you were born to be. I'm going to say it again. There is no point. There is no purpose. There is no prosperity. There is no nothing if it does not contribute to your personal destiny. Now, I believe we have corporate destiny as the body of Christ, but we also have the subject of individual destiny, which is who are you? Why are you here? Why did Jesus chose, choose you? Why did he save you? And what, what are you supposed to go? What is the world supposed to be like as a byproduct of your journey on the earth? We have got to talk about destiny. I have often said to my church, Jesus Christ did not just die for your sins. He actually died for your highest potential. The, the, the Old Testament priests were offering blood sacrifices for sins and it would not suffice. Why? Because that only made atonement for sin, but it did nothing for the human condition. The bloods of pigeons and bulls and goats and lambs were satisfying God's wrath against sin, but it was not satisfying his heart about the highest potential that the human race was not living in. And so the blood of Jesus was the only blood that was sufficient enough to give us access to the highest potential of the human race. And your highest potential may end you up in various platforms, in various levels of influence, in various levels of prosperity, in various levels of, of visibility. Jesus Christ does not just want you to live, die, and go to heaven or hell. What he wants you to do is to affect your world. Be an anointed businessman, an anointed scientist, an anointed entertainer, an anointed whatever you're going to be. The anointing of God is specific to all things pertaining to human life. You can be anointed and do it. But when we did not preach destiny, we made people bored. People are bored with church. A whole nother periscope, but they're bored. There you come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, they're just telling Jesus thank you all their life. Listen, what are we supposed to be doing that makes our thank you mean something? I tell you what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be equipping people for destiny. You were born for a purpose. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. You've got very, very, very real reasons behind your existence. And so because of that, there's supposed to be explanations. There's supposed to be uh, investigations. There's supposed to be impartations. There's supposed to be all kinds of stuff that help you understand who God made you to be. See, the problem is not just exploring God. God's mind, he put his mind on paper so that we could learn his personal 
personality. You know what the bigger mystery is? Is you. And, 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 and you are the biggest mystery and so you can't find you until you find him. And the way God set it up is that as you seek him, you learn yourself and what he invested in you and what he placed in you from before the foundation of the world and where he want you to go and where he want you to do and how he intended to use your life and why you were born in the season you were born. Why your strengths are what they are. Why your weaknesses are what they are. Why your victories are what they are. Why your flaws are what they are. Why your adversary is what it is. And so it's so important. There's a lot of robots and zombies walking around in the church because they just have no clue what they're doing and, and uh, what life is about. But destiny is the reason behind life. Destiny is the reason behind life. It's the reason why you are alive. So I gave you our vision, which is the challenge. C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G-E -E is our acronym for our vision, which is what we're supposed to do. But um, how we're going to do it is by crafting a way of life. It's a philosophy of life. And if it be possible, all of the thousands of people that are part of what we do have got to be anchored in these Ds. They have got to understand the power of deliverance. And, and so for that reason, I don't care how much pressure folk try to put on our stuff. Y'all always talking about the devil. I, you, you're absolutely right because y'all don't talk enough about him. So yeah, we talk about devils. We talk about fallen culture. Life in a fallen world. Life in a fallen society. Life with fallen doctrine. Life with fallen behavior. We talk about all of that because the Bible said you're supposed to be in the world and not of it. So because we're in a fallen world, we've got to understand how important it is to remain lifted around that that has fallen. And so because of the absence of in interpretation about that, the absence of clarity about that, the absence of information about that, people don't know how to behave and how to interact and how to partner and how to process and how to move in a fallen culture. So when you are in a fallen culture, you've got to have a philosophy and a constitution from somewhere that is higher than the culture you live in to guide your behavior, to determine, to disciple your, desire, your desires and to help you know where to go. So for that reason, you can't talk about falling or being fallen and can't talk about the devil. So yeah, if that bothers you, unfortunately, but as for me and my house, we believe in the breaking of curses and we believe in the casting out of devils and we believe in the spirit of war because listen the lamb was slain did you hear what I said the lamb was slain and the lamb was not necessarily interested in his enemies he was interested in being a redeemer but once the lamb was slain he was a lion and he came as a lion because he was confrontational. He had enemies, he had adversaries, he had opponents, he had things and peoples that need to be devoured. The lamb was slain, but now he's postured as a victorious, unbeatable, very vicious, aggressive, assertive, decided lion who knows what he wants and has a territory by which he reigns over and it's the souls of men. So the lamb was slain, I get it. But now we're understanding that he is raging war through the streets of America because his foes are going trying to counteract what he did in Calvary and he's a very aggressive man. The Lord is his name and he is a man of war. So everybody needs to understand the power of casting out devils. Everybody's got to understand the power of spiritual warfare and the fact that we've got tongue talking Christians running around shouting and dancing and jump roping at the church but don't understand spiritual warfare. I mean we go around here talking about what Paul said and I'm gonna put on the whole armor of God and we don't realize that Paul basically announced that if you're going to be a Christian, you have enlisted in permanent war. Why do you have armor if your life is not going to be a battlefield? We, what we teach you to do is we teach you to cope with stuff you don't know how to gain control over. But when Paul said that you had to pull on the whole armor of God, he was basically letting you know that if you're going to live this thing out, your life will be spent in spiritual combat. And what a disservice we have done by robbing believers of their right to learn what that looks like by telling them all they got to do is hoping some pie in the sky American dream breathe in and out and go to yoga and they'll have peace of mind. See, there's something you need to do beyond the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind is extremely important, but if you don't help people to know that their life is going to be in consistent conflict with the forces of hell, then what they're going to do is be devastated when they realize that you taught them about heaven and you didn't teach them that they were hated in hell. And if they're hated in hell, they're going to be attacked by hell and you've got to teach people how to rise up and fight. That's very important. So that's deliverance. It's a part of all we do. Snatching people out of the fire. Deliverance for families. Deliverance 
deliverance for cities, deliverance for nations, deliverance for cultures, deliverance. It's, it's the first thing that we do. It comes out in our worship, comes out in our prayer, comes out in our relationship. It even comes out in our love. It comes out in the way we love each other. Deliverance, deliverance, deliverance. We are an emancipating, a liberating force. Then uh, uh, devotion. We've got to teach you how to love God. Once you are no longer filled with his adversary and you are no longer a slave to your nature, we're going to teach you to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, with all of your mind, all of your strength. You've got to love God and you've got to love God and become a worshiper. Something that is, understands the power of worship and quality time and consistent lives of, 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 of sacred pursuit and of reckless abandon. That's, that's the life of devotion where you teach me and it's not just about hooping and grabbing your ear. No preacher is greater than his prayer life. I don't care how many rhymes and Humpty Dumpties and London bridges you preach. No preacher is bigger than his prayer life. And if we don't teach people how to let devotion and its power invade their days, they're going to lose no matter how gifted they are. It's got to be devotion where you, we teach people the culture of seeking God and finding him on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's devotion. After devotion, then you've got this powerful word called discipleship. We're relating to one another, small groups, mentoring, families, tribes, you know. Kevin Lill taught me that the, the American church is failing right now because she's built plantations and factories and called them churches when the church is really about tribes and families families and tribes, not just plantations and factories. So that's important, relating to people. You ought to be just as anointed behind the pulpit as you are in a restaurant. You ought to be just as anointed in a healing line as you are in Starbucks. You ought to be just as anointed on the altar as you are on a living room floor where through quality time you transform lives and you give a language for destiny and you get enough people around you and you start to raise people up in a discipleship culture. So that's very important. Important. You've got to be a discipler. You've got to make disciples. And then immediately after discipleship, there is a, a, a great, great, great discussion about being a demonstrator. That we're going to indoctrinate you, but the point of doctrine is demonstration. If you cannot exhibit and if you cannot become the exemplar of your education, then your education is weak, raggedy, frail, dead, lifeless, sterile, and incapable of making any real fruit be born in your life. Doctrine is a seed. Doctrine is not fruit. Doctrine is a seed that's supposed to spring up in you and become a reality and become a tangible uh, uh, expression of what was invested in you through doctrine. I can't tell you how many Christians, heady, arrogant, that's what the Bible says, knowledge, but puffs up. People are engrafted in doctrine for years and when they're challenged on why they believe what they believe, they got they get offended in the name of what they were taught. And then they come to, to educational settings talking about what they were always taught as if what they were always taught is incapable of being flawed or erroneous. You got to have the whole counsel of God be supported in you and invested in you. The Bible says the sower sows the word. The doctrine is released in the form of the seed. But what good is a seed if it doesn't bear fruit? See that doctrine needs to be done. It's called demonstration. You demonstrate what you were indoctrinated. Now, I would leave any place that didn't give me nothing to demonstrate. I'm going to just put that out there. And then finally, it's going to be destiny. Why are you alive? The church of Jesus Christ is the only place on the planet that has the authority to release people into destiny. Boy, that's a very powerful thing. I want you to hear that. It's the church of Jesus Christ that's the only organism on the planet that has the authority from heaven to release people into the reason they are alive. The YMCA can't do it, no psychologist can do it, no degree can do it. There is one organism on the planet that has been authorized to give people access into their destiny on planet earth. Other than that, they gotta figure it out or stumble onto it. But without Jesus Christ, he said, I'm the door, I'm the keeper of the sheep, I'm the way. So if you're gonna find out how to get to where you're going to get to, it's got to be through the house of God. Amen, he's put your purpose in his house. So that is our fivefold philosophy. Um, <laughs> I get stirred up, and every real pastor should get stirred up 
when they're talking about their vision. And if they don't, then they shouldn't be pastoring. They should actually be an under shepherd or elder or a deacon, but they shouldn't be over a house. That's why we are visionaries because we are the vision we, we project to our people and should be able to recite it, articulate it, and to preach it at a moment's no notice because it should be in you intravenously. If you're going to craft a people and if you're going to fashion a people that is going to embody what God showed you in a vision, then you've got to be able to say it at the drop of a hat and defend it and justify it and uphold it by the scripture and manifest it in your walk. So that's the fivefold philosophy of ministry for all nations worship assembly. Um, we have a vision. That's our challenge. C-H-A-L-L-E-N-G-E. -L -L -E -E. And then we have uh, a philosophy of ministry. Those five Ds determines everything we do. It's a way of life. It's how we do life. It's how we relate to each other. It's the flavor of all that we do. It's going to have one of those Ds on there. I hope this gave you a good example um, for you to go back and rethink and revisit and re-clarify your vision. And uh, maybe even to ask your pastors what's in his heart. If you uh, follow a man or a woman and you want to know the direction of your house, I hope this gave you something to consider and something to think about. So this is very, very, very important for you. So thank you so much for spending this time with me. I wanted to vent and get that uh, out of my system. This is our way of life. So this is going to be a phenomenal season and a phenomenal day. All right, I'm going to leave this up, I guess. I suppose pray for Periscope. She's been manifesting very, very, very strongly lately. <laughs> but I'll see you guys tonight. All right, peace out.